I'm going to start pressing the record button. Alrighty. So, those of you that on Discord would have noticed that I added this must know fact on Discord. You need to know this. If A is bigger than zero, then the derivative of a to the power x is a to the power x times ln a. You learned this in first year. You need to know this for second year mathematics. So in this question, you, this pops up because x is a fixed, so the variable is something to the y. And so if you differentiate it, the majority got it right. Give, my, give, you, give you guys a smiley face in the chat that the correct answer to this multiple choice is A. So if you got B, C, and D, please go and do more questions like this in the textbook and pat yourself on the back if you said A. So the correct answer to this warm-up problem is A. I, I was looking for A, not B not C, not D. The correct answer to this warm-up problem is A. Alrighty, so we've done the warm-up problem. Just quickly, admin-wise, remember homework three is due for your tutorial if today if you have your tutorial or tomorrow when you have your tutorial. There is no homework next week and please continue to do maths every day. So part of that is attending life lessons, but part of that is also doing the worked out examples in the textbook, doing the exercises in the textbook and focus on deep learning. That's very important. And mastering the concepts. So focus on deep learning and mastering the concepts. So do focus on that. And as you know, 21 March is Human Rights Day. So I want to ask you guys kindly to, on that day, if you can, do three hours of 218. You are already noticing that the stuff that we're doing in 218 is non-trivial. And it's important that you practice, practice, practice these problems, these ideas, these concepts, that you understand it quite well. Alrighty, it is 8.30, so let's get the party started. So we defined differentiability. So differentiability is a property of functions, and this is the definition. Let f be a function of two variables, x and y, with domain d, which is a subset of r2 and an open set. You can, can I get a smiley face? This is why you need to understand what is an open set. It's built into the definition of differentiability. And then you assume that AB is the element of D such that if partial X at that point exists and if partial Y at that point exists. And then for a non-zero vector HK, we define the crocodile and the crocodile is this expression. Can I get a yes if you've written down this five times this week already? So E H K is defined as this fraction F of A plus H comma B plus K minus F A B minus H F partial X at the point minus K F partial Y at the point over the root of H squared plus K squared. Can I get more yeses? Surely there has to be more than two people that have written down the definition for the crocodile. You need to know this off by heart. You need to know the crocodile off by heart. And then we say, if it's differentiable at this point, at this 2D vector AB, if the limit as HK approaches the origin of the absolute value of the crocodile is equal to zero. This is the definition of differentiability and you've got to learn to love it it will definitely pop up in semester test one. So please make sure that you are comfortable and confident with this definition of differentiability. All right, 
Now, how do you prove differentiability? The first step is to find f partial x and f partial y at that point. The next step is to find the crocodile. And the last step is to show that the limit as hk approaches the origin of the absolute value of e equals to zero. And 99% of the time, you use the squeeze theorem to do that. So I've uploaded an extra example of proving differentiability. So if you haven't looked at it this week, please look at it this weekend or on 21 March. Look at that extra example and do it. Maths is not a spectator sport. Maths is something you've got to have plenty of blue pens and black pens and paper and actually tackle problems, battle with problems to make sure that you understand it quite well. All right. On the flip side, you could also have that the function is not differentiable at that point. So what you then do is you construct a path RT. You've got to make sure it's a nice path. So it's continuous. Um, when you plug in zero, you're at the origin. And when T is non-zero, you're not at the origin. And then you want to show that the limit as T goes to zero of the absolute value of ERT is non-zero. And if that happens, then you can say by theorem 45, that the limit of the absolute value of e is non-zero and therefore f is not differentiable because it didn't satisfy the definition. So please practice, 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 practice this. I can't emphasize this enough. Do the questions in the textbook, make your own examples, but you got to be comfortable proving that a function is differentiable at a point. That's the first strategy or the function is not differentiable at the point, you employ the second strategy. I have only done one example of each. We don't have time to do a hundred examples. That responsibility is yours. You've got to make sure that you do enough examples. Are there any questions? There's time for one quick question. So in the previous lesson, I did an example of proving differentiability. There's an extra example under my tab, Dr. Wiggins notes. And I've also done an example where I prove a function is not differentiable at a point. And now it's up to you to ensure you know the definition and that you practice, 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 practice this. Practice this, that you know this extremely well. Alrighty. So let's move onwards and upwards. All right. Now, you know that there's a mean value theorem for a function of one variable. Theorem 65 is the mean value theorem for a function of two variables. So as you've noticed, the majority of this course, we care about functions of two variables. Why? Because if you can do this for two variables, the, the calculation is a little bit longer, but it's extremely similar for functions of three variables. So the jump from one to two variables are big, but to go from two to three to four variables ain't that big. So we are spending our time ensuring that we understand functions of two variables quite well. So here is the wording again. So let D be a subset of R2. And again, it's an open set. If it's a map from D to R and AB is the element of D. And we assume that if partial X and if partial Y exist on D. So that means on every element of D, if partial X and if partial Y exist. Remember, D is a set. It's an open subset of R2. If HK is a non 2D zero vector and it's sufficiently small, then the mean value theorem for a function of two variables says the following. That if you look at F of A plus H comma B plus K minus F A B, that difference can be written in the following form. It's a green term plus the pink term. So the green term is h f partial x at a specific point plus k f partial y at a specific point and to the existence of these points need two values theta foot script h theta foot script k which is sitting in this open interval from zero to one so this result is known as the mean value theorem for a function of two variables so it is saying that that point minus that point can be written as h f partial x at a certain point involving theta h plus k f partial y at a certain point involving theta k. So the proof is quite long and I am not going to do the proof 
in this live lesson. Marco, it's a theorem. You can't argue with a theorem. Marco, it's a theorem, so you can't argue with a theorem. So, Jaden, so let me give you a little idea of, of, of how this proof goes. So, the proof goes as follows. So, the proof goes as follows. So, look at what I'm doing here. Um, look what I'm doing here. So, I'm connecting the point AB to the point A plus H, B plus K with a vertical line and a horizontal line. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see that? All right. So we are connecting it with a vertical line and a horizontal line. So in the vertical line, X is equal to A. So it is essentially a function of one variable. So we can apply the mean value theorem, the function of one variable, and we can get a theta k. And on the second line segment L2, you can see it is the y value is b plus k. So then we can turn it into a function of one variable, and we can end up using the mean value theorem of a function of one variable. So this is the idea behind this proof. It goes as follows. So you connect the one point with the other point and you end up getting a scenario like this happening. So if you look at the pink part, Aiden, can you see in the pink part? In the, in the pink part, which is line segment L1, the first coordinate is A, and the line segment starts here, and it ends here. So what you're going to have is, you're going to have a point B plus theta K. Um, let me just get this right. So... B plus theta k k. Because if theta k is equal to zero, you get this point. And if theta k is equal to one, you get this point. So if theta k is between zero and one, it will be somewhere there. Jaden, are you here? So the pink part has no H. So the pink part has no H. Okay, so this is the idea. The technicality is in the textbook. The technicality is in the textbook. So what you do is you go from this point to this point using a vertical line segment, and then from that point to that point using a horizontal line segment. So you apply the mean value theorem of one variable on each line segment, and then it turns into that result. All right? So um, for now, the answer is yes, Marco. Marco, can I get a yes that you're going to do three hours of maths on 21 March? On 21 March, you need to do three hours of maths. Great. Now, <laughs> that proof is in the textbook, and the idea is very simple. To go from that point to that point, you, you have line segment L1, you apply the mean value theorem there, you get a term. You go from there to there using a horizontal line and you apply the mean value theorem and then you get another term and it's actually very easy. But this is the more important question. What can we do with this theorem? This theorem 65, what can we do with this theorem? And the answer is lots. I.e. theorem 67 can be proven using the mean value theorem of a function of two variables. All right. So this theorem is very important because it's quite powerful. And you will see in the theory that we're doing today. Can you guys, can I have five people write the word summary? So please, all, most of the results that I'm mentioning today can be proven using 
the mean value theorem for a function of two variables. So please make a summary of today's lesson. Make a summary of today's lesson. It's important that you appreciate the powerfulness of this result. So one of the results that you can prove using this theorem is the following. And it's called theorem 67. So let D be a subset of R to be an open set and consider a function F mapping D to R. Assuming that f partial x and f partial y exist on D, and so let me say that again, and that f partial x and f partial y is continuous at the point AB, which is the element of D, then f is differentiable at AB. So theorem 67 is an alternative to proving differentiability that allows you not to use the crocodile. And theorem 67 goes as follows. If you have the following four conditions, so an alternative way of stating theorem 67 is saying the following. If partial x exists on D, condition one. If partial y exists on D, that's condition two. If partial x is continuous at the point AB, which is in D, and if partial y is continuous at the point AB, which is in D, if those four conditions are met, then you can say, F is differentiable at the point AB. Can I get a smiley face if you understand what theorem 67 is saying? Can I get a smiley face that you also see that this is an alternative to proving differentiability? So please read the theorems more than once. So for this theorem, you have all of the setups. And if these four conditions are met, then you are jumping for joy because then you can safely say F is differentiable at the point AB. Now, remember, I want you guys to ask questions in tutorials. And a question that a mathematician asks is the following. Is the converse true? So uh, what is the converse statement? That is, if F is differentiable at the point AB, does it imply that if partial x and if partial y is continuous at the point a b all right so some people are saying yes no some are saying maybe all right now the answer to this question is no the answer to this question is no it's quite shocking if you want to see see example 68 in the book so do not get lost in the words have a look at example 68 in the book example 68 in, in the book is in an example of a function that is differentiable at the origin but if partial x and if partial y is not continuous at the origin so that example illustrates why the converse is not always true. So if you said yes, you need to do example 68 either on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or on Monday as part of your three hours of maths that you're doing on Monday. Because there are functions out there like the function in example 68. It is differentiable at the origin. But if partial x and if partial y is not continuous at the origin. So do not get lost in the theory. Can I get a few more people to write summary? It is important that you make a summary. Yes, Clarica. Clarica, a lot of the time to construct these counterexamples, you use piecewise functions. Because piecewise functions allows you to come up with interesting functions with interesting properties, like the one in an example 68, where f is differentiable at the point 0, 0, but f partial x and f partial y is not continuous at the origin. So heaps of interesting examples pop up when you look at piecewise functions. So,
Do not underestimate this course. The more maths you do, the better. Okay? So take note that we can ask this as a theory question in, in multiple choice or in section B. Um, Clarica, can you email that question to me? Um, let's continue with the lesson. Um, you can also ask that question on Discord. So, guys, do you see how easy it is to make your own question and see if you can solve it? So, if you are here, give a thought to Clarica's question and see if you can come up with an answer to that. All right. I really want you guys to focus on deep learning and mastering the concepts. That's very important for us. All right. So, Clarica, there's a request if you can post that problem on Discord, please. All right. So, let's look at the following problem. Let f be a function from r squared to r, where f partial x and f partial y are polynomials of two variables. Read the question carefully. It says, you have to use theorem 67 and prove f is differentiable at the point 6, 7. So, before we use this problem, who can tell me what is the domain of this function? Who can tell me, reading this problem carefully, what is the domain of this unknown function? No, nope, Ben, try again. It's r squared. f is a function of two variables, and the domain is r squared. That's very important. And what is special about R squared, anybody? What is special about R squared? R squared is the entire 2D plane, but I need more than that, Ben. Yes, the word that I'm looking for, which is an open set. We want to use theorem 67, so we've got to make sure that the domain is open, all right? Ben, it is close, but for this problem, we care about D being open. Ben, can I get a smiley face? We're focusing on that property, that D is open. We want to employ theorem 67. So we are happy because D is open. How many conditions does theorem 67 have? Let's see who, who remembers. Yes, there's four conditions. There's four conditions. So let's write that down so fx exists on d who can give me the reason why is that and if y exists on d who can give me the reason for that yes because um fx is a polynomial if y is a polynomial we know that polynomials exist everywhere now next we're going to say fx is continuous at 6 7 which is obviously sitting in the entire plane and who can give me the reason for this so if partial x exists everywhere on d if partial y exists everywhere on d now who can tell me why is f partial x continuous at this specific point 6 7 Yes, Pungiwe. All right. If you want to, you can quote exercise 2.4, question 4 as a reason. Or you can say polynomials are continuous everywhere. And then you can also say that if partial y is continuous at this point, this 2D vector 6, 7, again, you can quote the reason as exercise 2.4, question 4. All right. And now we have shown that all four conditions are met so now we can say so by theorem 67 f is differentiable at the 2d vector 6 7 and we're done any questions on this proof so we prove differentiability using theorem 67 so to use the theorem we showed that the conditions of the theorem are met and therefore we can employ theorem 67 and we can say that even though we don't know what the function is, 
the function is differentiable at the point six seven. All right, so we can make proofs where you get to use any of the theorems in the textbook. So you have to know the entire textbook. I'm pausing. I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. So it's important that you know your theory quite well. Okay. You can see we even employed theory a little bit here that polynomials are continuous everywhere. That is a very important fact. Polynomials are continuous everywhere. That is why chapter two was so important to us because one of the things that we learned that polynomials of one variable or two variables or three variables or five variables, they are continuous everywhere. That's one of many reasons why we like polynomials. All right, now, I'm not going to prove theorem 69, but theorem 69 is not a big shock. Let f be a function of two variables with domain D, which is a subset of R2 and an open set. If f is differentiable at the point AB, then f is continuous at the point AB. So can I get a smiley face that you see that our crazy definition of differentiability using the crocodile we still get that differentiability implies continuity. Even though now we're dealing with functions of two variables. If a function is differentiable at a point, the function is also continuous at that point. Can I get more yeses, please? This shows us that our definition of differentiability is good, okay? That if a function is differentiable at a point, it is continuous at that point. So even though it might seem like a crazy definition, we still have this result that holds for functions of two variables. So the proof is exercise 3.2 number one. So please give it a go. The proof is exercise 3.2 number one. So give it a go on this long weekend. Now the contrapositive says that if f is not continuous at a point, then f is not differentiable at a point. Can I get a smiley face that this is an alternative to prove non-differentiability? Maybe you did a little calculation and it happened that f is not continuous at that point. Then you have an alternative to prove that f is not differentiable at that point. Just like a function of one variable. If it's not continuous at a point, then it's not differentiable at a point because this is the contrapositive of theorem 69. All right. So it should be obvious, but I'm just mentioning it for awareness. So if you have spent two pages proving that f is not continuous at a point, then you do not have to spend two more pages. You can say immediately f is not differentiable at that point because of the contrapositive of theorem 69. Okay, so we're throwing a lot of theory, but it's important that you understand the ideas of differentiability quite well. So differentiability at a point implies continuity at a point. Okay, so read carefully and make sure you understand what you are reading. All right. Let me just quickly see. So this is this question. So these theorems won't hold if the domain is a closed set. Um, so no comment. Okay. So then it will be a new result. All right. So be careful. All right. So be careful. All right. So the, uh, remember the reason why we want open sets. All right, so let me just emphasize this again. The reason why we, we want open sets, because remember we take limits. So if we have an open set like this, and we have a point, then all of the paths we can take to that point. But if we have a closed set, then we have issues as Ben said at the boundaries. 
Can I get a smiley face that you guys see that? So look at this close set. If I'm picking this point, then I can't have a path going like this because this is outside the region. This is outside the region. So this is issues. So this is issues. So, so we prefer to deal with functions whose domain is an open set. Because look at, the, at, 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 at this region on the right. If I want to visit this pink point coming from right to left, that path is visiting the point, but it contains points that's totally outside the region. And so you're going to run into troubles if you do limits. Mr. Makaba, that's a good question. Can I get a smiley face that you are happy with this? But if you have an open set, any path that you will take will eventually be inside the region. So for these theorems, we prefer dealing with open sets for an, a very good reason. Okay. So for now, we are caring about the idea of differentiability. Okay. And so we want to make sure that any path that we take to visit the point, that it will be eventually inside the region. And it's clearly not the case here. All right. I hope that answers your question. It's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. And you're making my heart warm and fuzzy asking these great questions. All right. A new theorem. Um, Clarica, I, I think that's another question to ask on on discord all right so i want to move on maybe i won't be able to finish the lesson all right so let f be a function of two variables with domain d which is a subset of r2 and an open set that is why it is important that i hope you guys spend time on chapter 2.1 if f is differentiable at the point a b which is in element of region d then all directional derivatives exist for any unit vector. Can I get a smiley face that theorem 71 says that if a function is differentiable at a point, then all of the directional derivatives exist. How amazing is theorem 71? That if a function is differentiable at a point, then every single directional derivative you can imagine. So pick any unit vector u, all of the directional derivatives exist. Can I get more smiley faces? Surely I can't just get two smiley faces. I mean, by now you guys should have done a couple of directional derivatives. And this is truly amazing. Theorem 71 also shows us that even though our definition of differentiability was so crazy, can I get one more smiley face? That if the f is differentiable at that point, then every single directional derivative at that point exists. Thank you, Marco. All right. So please make summaries of this chapter. So the question is, is the converse true? Is there a function where all the directional derivatives exist and where it's not differentiable? And the answer is, is the converse true? And the answer is no. I want you guys to have a look at example 63. Example 63 is a function where all of the directional derivatives exist, but the function is not, the function is not differentiable at that point. All right, Mohammed, you still owe me a factorization. And Mohammed, as Ms. Duby says, this is your job this long weekend. Do exercise 3.6 number 11. Thank you, Ms. Dube. All right. Mohammed, A, you still owe me a factorization. And the proof of this is your job this long weekend. Okay. So please, you all have a hard copy of the textbook. So you got to get your hands dirty and do these exercises in the textbook okay it is important that you try it out so you appreciate this wonderful result theorem 71 one final result that 
I have to mention is theorem 72. Theorem 72 is a mouthful. Let f be a function of two variables, Swift domain D, which is a subset of R2, which is open. If f is differentiable at the point A, B, which element of D, then we all know by theorem 71 that all of the directional derivatives exist. But we can say more. Not only do we know that all of the directional derivatives exist at the point AB, but it also depends continuously on the direction. That is, the limit as theta goes to theta naught of D theta FAB is equal to D theta naught FAB. Who can tell me in the chat, how do you convert an angle to a unit vector so that you can do a directional derivative? How do you convert an angle to a unit vector? Yes. So, so for the red part, for the red part, your unit vector will be cos theta, sine theta, and then for the pink part, your unit vector will be um, cos theta zero, sine theta zero. And so what this result is saying that if you want to figure out what does D theta FAB mean, it's a map from R to R. So your input will be an angle theta, which you then convert into a unit vector, cos theta, sine theta. And then what you will do is you will calculate the value that the directional derivative using the unit vector cos theta sine theta and that will be your output and what this is saying is the following is if you imagine this on the on the axis as follows the proof is again mr rasul can i get a smiley face the proof is again left as an exercise for you to do today mr rasul it's again left as an exercise for you to do today. All right. So let's say theta zero is the angle pi over four. And if you do this directional derivative, you maybe get a value of three. So if you do this pink direction, you get a value of maybe 2.9. And if you do this pink direction, you get a value of 2.99. You do this pink direction, you get a value of 2.999. So the closer your angles get to theta zero, the closer your directional derivatives get to the value of the directional derivative using the angle of theta zero. All right. Is this making sense to you guys? So if a function is differentiable at a point, not only do all of the directional derivatives exist, but it also varies continuously. So here I, I've drawn the angle pi over four. So that's theta naught. Let's for argument say that this directional derivative has a value of three. Yeah, so now what I'm saying is, Ms. Dube, do you see my pink angles? They get closer and closer and closer to theta naught. So if I take this one, the directional derivative is maybe 2.9. This one is even closer. The directional derivative is 2.99. This one is even closer and the directional derivative is 2.999. So the closer the angle gets to theta naught, the closer the directional derivative that that angle gives becomes to the directional derivative that the angle theta naught gives. Let me just do a quick poll. Are you kind of getting it? So the big takeaway here is if a function is differentiable at a point, then all the directional derivatives exist. But theorem 72 say, says even more that if you draw a graph of angle, versus directional derivative, then that will be a continuous function. So theorem 72, you can interpret it in many ways. So they've given it in an equation format. But if you draw a graph where you plot angle as input and the output is the directional derivative you get when you calculate 
the directional derivative with that angle at this specific point where we have differentiability, that it will be a continuous function. Yes, Malusi. Yes, Malusi. Okay. So you. So if if you're in two D, then your angles will be from zero to two pi. Uh, Marco, this is for you to discover, for you to discover. So I really don't want to let the cat out of the bag for some of these things that you guys are asking. I want you guys to try out these things. If you have a maths buddy, talk to your maths buddy about these ideas. Okay, so I want you guys to run with your ideas and see what you can discover. Thank you for voting. So six people are saying no. Again, the proof is left as an exercise in the textbook for you to do. All right. So I, I quickly want to do this warm up question. All right. Let's, uh, let's quickly do this warm up question. I, I mean, are you a white question? I mean, so the question is F is an unknown function, but you are told that. The directional derivative of f at the point one three do not exist for some unit vector u. Can you now safely say f is definitely differentiable at the point one three? That's option A. Or can you definitely say f is not differentiable at the point one three? Or is this a don't know such a scenario that maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You need more information. What do you guys think? Let me repeat the question. Thank you for that. So the question is, somebody told you that the directional derivative of f at the point 1, 3 for some unit vector u do not exist. Then what is definitely true? f is differentiable at the point. f is not differentiable at the point. Or we don't know about the differentiability. Clarica, is that clear? Yes or no? So what do you definitely know? If it's definitely differentiable at the point or if it's not differentiable? I hope you guys notice that the theory is tricky. All right. So thank you for voting. Two is going with A. 30 is going for B. 22 is going for C. And the majority is getting a gold star. The answer to this question is B. If F was differentiable at the point, by theorem 71, all of the directional derivatives exist. So the answer cannot be A. And therefore, we know that F is not differentiable. Melusi, it's theorem 71. Melusi, theorem 71. Can I get theorem 71, Melusi? Theorem 71 says that if a function is differentiable at a point, then all of the directional derivatives exist. That is why the answer to this is B. Alrighty, as you know, two and eight lessons are jam packed. So I'm already going to start moving to chapter 3.3. So please make a summary of chapter 3.2 that you know the theory quite well. So we want to talk about tangent planes in this chapter. So let's just remind ourselves in first year, y equal to fx, we could sketch the curve, we could pick a point AFA. And we can draw a tangent line denoted by Lx. So the equation of the tangent line is Lx is equal to f dash a x minus a plus f a. Can I get a smiley face that you guys remember this from first year? This is the formula for a tangent line at the point a f a. If you've forgotten it, please write it down 10 times today. You need to know this. All right. Now, 
if we have a function of two variables and we draw a function of two variables, what object do we get? What object do we get when we draw a function of two variables? Chapter one, you guys wrote a class test on that. What do you guys get? What do you get when you have a function of two variables that you draw? You get a surface. You get a surface. So on the surface, you pick a point. And now in the 2D case, tangent line turns into tangent plane. Can I get a smiley face? So if you have a function of one variable and you pick a point, you want a tangent line. But if you have a function of two variables and you pick a point, now you're interested in a tangent plane. So this is how it transforms. So tangent line transforms into tangent planes when you are dealing with functions of two variables. Okay. So then the good question would be, how do you define a tangent plane? So intuitively, if I give you a surface, you pick a point with a piece of paper, you can say what it looks like, but we want to define this mathematically. We want to do things rigorously. All right. So before we go to the 2D case, let's backtrack a little bit. So when we backtrack, we ask ourselves, so the question is, what is a good formula for a tangent plane in this setting? But before we answer that question, we are going back for a tangent line. If we define E H as F of A plus H minus L A B over H, this is known as the relative error. And let's just quickly see why is this the case. So let's quickly do the limit as H goes to zero of E H if it's defined in this manner. So what we have in this scenario is the limit H goes to zero of H at the bottom. If A B, we can't change. Sorry, if A plus H. And remember, this is formula one. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see? In formula one, I'm replacing X with what? In formula one, I'm replacing, so replace x with, who can tell me? Yeah, a plus h. So we're replacing it with a plus h. So we get the following. It's good to use brackets. It's good to use brackets. So it's f dash a a plus h minus a plus f a and let's simplify a little bit so a plus h minus a is h so we end up getting the following we get f of a plus h minus f dash a times h minus f of a which we can simplify to the following. The limit h goes to zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And now h over h cancels and this becomes minus f dash a. And who can tell me if f is differentiable at a, what is the value of this expression? What is the value of this expression? Anybody? I'm hearing crickets. Yeah. If f is differentiable at a, this pink cloud becomes f dash a, f dash a minus f dash a equals zero. So you can see the limit h goes to zero of this term, which some textbooks denote as the relative error goes to zero. So indeed, thank you, Marco. A virtual chocolate to, Mar to Marco for saying zero. So we can see that the function is approximately the linear approximation for x near a because the limit h goes to zero of e h is equal to zero. All right. Now, another virtual chocolate goes to Malusi. So what you do to help you to define the equation of the tangent plane, you use two directional derivatives. And the ones that we like the most is f partial x and f partial y. Malusi, can I get a smiley face? 
out of out of the infinitely many directional derivatives out there we like f partial x and f partial y the most because we can use theorem 55 because of theorem 55 so here is the definition so let f be a function of two variables with domain and open set d which is a subset of r2 containing the point a b so what we want to now do is define the equation of the tangent plane at the point a b f a b can I get a yes? And remember, this is in 3D. I'm living in 3D. You're living in 3D. So the point AB, FAB, this is in 3D. So we want to define the tangent plane at that point. And so the way we do it is the following. So the tangent plane is a set of 3D vectors, x bar, such that minus f partial x at the point AB, minus f partial y at the point a b comma one so this part is the normal vector dotted with any point in the plane minus this specific point a b f a b so it is of the form n dot x minus r equal to zero which you saw in one two four which you saw in one two four that is the Cartesian equation of the plane. Again, just memorize it. It's a definition. So the Cartesian plane is all the 3D vectors x bar such that n dot x minus r is zero, where the normal vector is given by minus f partial x at the point, first component, minus f partial y at the point, comma one. And the r is the specific point that should be on the surface, a, b, f, a, b. And there you go. This is the tangent plane to the graph GF, which you sketch in chapter one of F at the point A, B, F, A, B. Now, if you do the mathematics, please do it today. You will see it turns into Z equals F, A, B plus F partial X at the point X minus A plus F partial Y at the point Y minus B. This is called the Cartesian equation for T. Again, I want to emphasize that the normal of the plane is given by minus f partial x at the point, minus f partial y at the point, and the last component has to be one. That is the definition. It has to be one. All right. So we continue and we can say that why not use the right hand side as the linear approximation? So we use the right hand side as a linear approximation. So if I replace x with a plus h and y with b plus k, and I, in this linear approximation, I end up getting this. And if I simplify it, it ends up looking like this. So please double check the maths that you agree with the mathematics that you end up getting this. And now we can continue and say, okay, let's look at the relative error. So the relative error in this case would be the absolute value of f at the point minus the linear approximation at the point over the norm of hk. So if we quickly do this math, we want to find this limit. So this becomes the limit as hk going to the origin of the absolute value of f at the point, which is this, the linear approximation at the point, which is this, and who can tell me, does it look familiar? Does it look familiar, anybody? Does it look familiar? Yes, it's the crocodile. And what is the value of the crocodile? What is the limit of the absolute value of a crocodile? It's zero. And your reason is since F is differentiable at the point AB. All righty. And so why are we jumping for joy because this limit goes to zero so ie a little bit of maths i'm going to leave it for you to verify we can see that the limit without the absolute values is also equal to zero so ie that the value of the function at the point f a plus h b plus k is approximately the value when you plug in a plus h b plus k in the linear approximation i.e for small 
values of H and K. Alrighty. So I think I'm going to stop there for